youtube.com slash sound. Hey, what's up, Legion? My name is Sal, and this is another Expedition Log. Welcome back from the holiday season, and welcome to 2023. In the penultimate episode of my 2019 New England tour, we're visiting an elfin mall with massive charm. As always, I hope you're all well. It took me like a month to get over whatever thing I was sick with, but I'm back, and please take care of yourselves. Thanks especially to my patrons and elite explorers, and to those who donate directly to me through Super Chats or whatever. Your support puts gas in Nightwing's tank, making trips like this possible. Today, I'd like you all to come take a walk with me and Jowdy through the Belknap Mall in Laconia, New Hampshire. But first, a word from our sponsors. The campiest commercial I've ever seen, showcasing Shaw's Supermarket and the now demolished Slides at Weir's Beach right at the start of Lake Winnipesaukee. Enjoy. Welcome to the Belknap Mall in Laconia, New Hampshire. This place is one of the more petite malls I've ever explored, but when you start to peel back the layers, there's some really weird stuff going on in here. But let's dive into the historical narrative. On July 3, 1971, it was announced that Massachusetts-based LaBelle Realty Trust would be accepting tenants for a new mall in Laconia, New Hampshire on Route 3 at the western end of the Laconia Bypass. The mall was aiming for an opening in spring of 1972 and would be anchored by a 45,000 square foot Mars Bargain Land department store and a 27,000 square foot Shaw's supermarket. After about one year of construction, the Belknap Mall had its formal ribbon cutting and grand opening dedication on August 8, 1972 with the opening of the Shaw's supermarket serving as the sole anchor. The mall cost LaBelle $2.1 million to build, and consisted of the Shaws and a 200-foot-long barbell-shaped concourse with a modest selection of shops throughout. Shopping for Prince Pasta at Shaws boils down to one thing, price. At just $1.99, cool bursts from Shaws are really taking off. At just $1.48, you get big savings on Prego Regular and Extra Chunky. And don't miss this weekly special at Shaw's.
One year after the mall opened, a Zare department store had its grand opening on November 15, 1973, with its courtyard now joining the concourse, connecting it with Shaw's. And what we're looking at right now used to be the Zare courtyard. The Belknap Mall would change hands for the first time when LaBelle sold the mall to Tom Flatley on July 18, 1978 for an undisclosed amount. But court documents show that Flatley took out two mortgages the same day that totaled $2.35 million against the Belknap Mall. This was back when developers were civil, and they weren't trying to just make gross profits at the behest of these properties. So LaBelle made a humble $250,000 profit on their mall. The Belknap Mall would coast through the 80s, enjoying local success with nearly full occupancy through the decade. This is a great area, right near Lake Winnipesaukee. It's a huge tourist industry, and in the Lakes region, this was the first enclosed mall. Then, on March 23, 1988, Flatley took out a new $8.5 million mortgage against the mall, just after construction had finished on a brand new, bigger anchor space for Zare, who moved in on April 28. And this is the newer building that Zare occupied, that we're looking into right now. After Zare moved out, a Decel clothing store opened in Zare's old space. However, just a few months after Zare opened in their new, bigger location, news broke that the chain was operating at a loss of nearly $70 million. By early October of 88, the parent company TJX sold the entire Zare chain of 392 stores to Ames department stores for $431 million in cash and $140 million in Ames stock. That wouldn't age very well. The Ames at Belknap Mall then had its grand opening that same month on October 26. This playground area thing, whatever you want to call this place, is one of the most dystopian things I've ever seen inside of a dead mall. Take note of this sign that says don't climb on the volcano. Take note of that, remember that. Now on one hand, I think this space is one of the most visually striking spaces that I've ever seen, in my own mind, because I like to find macabre, dark, liminal spaces, and to that aspect I think this is incredible. But on the other hand, why does this exist? Are kids actually coming here to play on these things? And I wonder what's inside those two rooms that probably used to be fitting rooms, but I wonder what's actually in there. So what is a mom gonna drop off their kid in here while they're getting their nails done next door? Stick with me through this episode because there's actually a bit of drama that occurred in here and I think it's why that paper sign that said don't climb on the volcano, I think that's why it's there. So just stay tuned. Some kid got hurt. But this place is one of the most liminal, creepy places I've ever seen. And I can't lie, if I was local to this mall, like close to it, and I worked nearby, I'd probably take my lunch break and eat it inside this playground. Like most malls that were well taken care of and sporting fresh renovations, the Belknap Mall enjoyed the height of its success in the 1990s. There was full occupancy and a healthy mix of tenants, despite the junior anchor Decel Clothing shuttering in 1996 to then be replaced by a blockbuster video one year later in 1997. But as the new millennium came, things would start to turn south, beginning with Belknap's senior anchor space. By August 14, 2002, Ames announced that they would be closing their remaining 327 stores after seeing dwindling sales and hundreds of other store closures since 1999. As Ames was winding down, liquidations began for their Chapter 7 bankruptcy, and the company would officially be defunct with all locations closed by October 19, 2002. In 2004, we would see some big changes when the Shaws received a 13,000 square foot expansion and the former Ames anchor space was reconfigured to accommodate a total of four tenants. The first to move in was a Big Lots on July 15, 2004. Then a Peebles moved in three months later on October 21. 
Then the following year, a Planet Fitness gym opened in August of 2005, and the fourth spot would remain vacant. As Tom Flatley was celebrating his 75th birthday, and the fact that he was number 754 on Forbes' list of the world's billionaires, at the same time he was also suffering from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, Lou Gehrig disease. Horrible. So he thought it was an appropriate time to step down and also wind down his company's operation. So he started marketing out his 10 mall catalog. All 10 malls were sold on May 8, 2007 to Boston-based OCW Retail for $500 million, with Belknap fetching $18.6 million. Mr. Flatley died one year later on May 17, 2008. And just to clarify, OCW was a partnership between New York-based O'Connor Capital Partners, who would manage the mall, and Boston-based Weiler Companies, who was the principal partner and majority owner. A few years after the mall was sold to OCW, in late 2010, the Planet Fitness would take advantage of the remaining space in the available fourth stall within the former Ames to expand its fitness club by about 4,000 square feet. The work cost about $300,000 and was finished by the middle of 2011. I really hope they sprung for the machines that have the hooks on them that you can hang your coats off of, because I definitely take full advantage of these hooks every day at the gym. That might sound completely random, but if you follow me on social media, you know. Anyway. OCW would receive some bad press in January of 2012 when the Valley News printed an article about a seven-year-old boy who fell six to eight feet to the ground from playground equipment inside the mall, that creepy liminal place that I showed you just a short while ago. The kid suffered a subdural hematoma for which he was treated and fully recovered, luckily. The boy's injuries cost OCW $95,000 when they settled with the family and most likely why management printed out and framed that, quote, please don't climb on top of the volcano sign. Remember, if there's a sign preventing you from doing something, it's always because someone either did something stupid or got hurt because of it. By the mid-2010s, the mall signed an interesting tenant at the former DeSalle space when a Clear Choice MD urgent care and walk-in clinic opened on December 1, 2014. At this time, like most of the other open businesses in this place, there was exterior access discouraging potential shoppers from entering the mall concourse. Despite heavy foot traffic at the Shaw's and a CVS, there was virtually no business inside the mall. In 2019, I showed up with Jowdy to film the footage you're looking at right now. And by the time 2020 rolled around, the mall resembled a four-sided strip mall that had a secret interior portion that got little to no attention. I'm not really a huge fan of Subway. I don't think it's great. Maybe it's because I hadn't eaten anything yet that day. That cheesesteak wrap totally slapped. That's a 7-6. OCW Retail sold the mall to Mason Asset Management for $4.25 million on April 9, 2020. At the time of the sale, the mall had an assessed value of $18.25 million, but things get super weird if you dig into the tax documents. The Belknap Mall is the town's largest taxpayer, and for the month of May 2020, the tax bill was $228,258. But looking at the court filing, the buyers were listed as Belknap Realty LLC as 95% owner and Belknap Nassim LLC as the minority owner. Both companies were created on March 26, 2020. 
and both have a mailing address in Great Neck, New York on Long Island, which is where the bill was headed. However, on the deed, neither of these two addresses were listed. Instead, there was an alternate address for an associated third company also in Great Neck, New York. This third company, Belknap Mall Realty Holdings, has a listing with the Secretary of State's office that lists Mehran Kohanzi, known by many names on paper, and none other than Mike Kohan as the manager for this company. Now, if you look on the Kohan Investment Group website, it matched the address recorded on the deed for Belknap Mall as of the April 2020 sale. The Laconia Daily Sun reached out to Kohan to see what was up, and the disgraced property vulture only said, quote, I didn't buy that mall. And then Kohan just hung up on the reporter. I'm not shocked. This whole thing is just so shady and completely on brand for the likes of Kohan. I believe he didn't buy this mall because it's still here and it's being turned around. But to clear it up, after that sale, Mason Asset Management was the new owner with Namdar managing. As 2020 came and dropped off its various grotesqueries on the world, the Belknap Mall was already dead inside, like most of us. But its new life as an outdoor strip mall with secrets was becoming more accepted in the community, and its owners embraced this. By 2021, the mall was 60% occupied, which is not the worst I've seen. However, most of these businesses were exterior access only, such as the Urgent Care, Planet Fitness, and some kickboxing joint. The mall lost its CVS, Maurice's, and Peebles in the last few years, along with most of their traditional inline tenants. But given its new layout prioritizing exterior businesses, the mall was still assessed at a value of about $18 million. Then OCW decided to shop the mall around to potential buyers, and after several months, it was sold on Thursday, February 10, 2022, to Massachusetts-based George and Ann Vernett for $7.85 million. They immediately announced that the shopping center would not be demauled, and they would be investing between $3 and $4 million to improve the property. Now, unlike a lot of developers I have come across, Kohan, Vernet has actually touched up the property with improvements to the parking lot and new signage, rebranding the mall to the Belknap Marketplace. I'm actually pretty hopeful for this mall, and if you're local, please hit me up in my comment section or social media with any updates you see. I'd love to hear from all of you. Links for all my social media are down below. New Hampshire is one of the most beautiful places I've ever visited anywhere in the world, especially the Lakes region. I actually spent a few summers here as a kid at the Heifetz Music Festival on Lake Winnipesaukee, and I've been dying to come back up here for a vacation ever since. When I filmed this episode, it didn't really dawn on me that I've been here before, and in hindsight, I really wish I had planned more time here for this trip, but I'll be back, I promise. I'd like to thank all of you for watching my video. I'd also like to thank my Elite Explorers and Patrons, again, for your direct support. You all absolutely rock, and I appreciate everything you've done for me over the years. Please make sure to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for some behind-the-scenes stuff and to keep up with what I'm doing. But the best way to keep in touch with me is on my Discord server, Home of Dmod. Just go to discord.gg dmod to join, then answer a couple of questions from the mods, and you're in. If you want crazy hysterical voice chats and endless Mario Kart racing at night, my Discord is just for you. I'll be back soon with Xlog 115, where we visit the Steeplegate Mall in Concord, New Hampshire, concluding the 2019 New England tour. But until then, please stay safe out there, everyone. Be good to each other, take care of yourselves, and have a fantastic day.